talking to book people about books and other stuff. Hi, my name's Lottie. I'm a bookseller at Mr B's Emporium of Reading Delights. And I am so excited because today I'm going to talk to the wonderful, genius and truly lovely man that is Edward Carey, who is the author and illustrator of Little, which is just behind me, is one of my all time favourite books. It's on my favourite shelf at Mr B's. Uh, But today we're going to talk about Edward's brand new book, uh, The Swallowed Man which came out in September of this year, and we have loved it at Mr B's. It's in our Christmas catalogue. My colleague Emma completely adored it and and passed it on to me, and I devoured it in two sittings, and I just cannot wait to talk to Edward about it. It is a retelling of the story of Geppetto, the carpenter who created Pinocchio, uh, but it focuses on the two years of his life spent in the belly of a giant shark. It's a book that really pulls on these themes of, of isolation and loneliness, which I think a lot of us are experiencing this year, uh, but is a, a beautiful fable about, about art and love and creation. Uh, the, one of the real highlights of the book is its smatterings throughout of incredible illustrations and photographs of Edward's own artwork, which give the book so much texture and life. And I am so excited to talk to him about how he created it and just to have a catch up on how his life has life has been in the last year or so. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to sign on and say hello to Edward. Hi Edward, how are you? I'm all right, thanks. I'm uh, surviving this strange time. How are you? <laughs> yeah, pretty much doing the same. Obviously, we're in very different parts of the world. You, you're still in Texas, is that right? I'm in Austin, Texas. Yeah, it's. Um, I, I, I long to leave Texas, to be frank, but. <laughs> I'm likely to be here for another six months. Oh, to be in Bath. Oh, I, I feel like I have to comment. I have to comment on the room that you're sat in, which is just fantastic. Well, yeah, but, uh, the trouble is with each book, I create more art. And so there's less space for humans. <laughs> <laughs> Are you in, is it a workshop or a study or a... Is oh, this is one. Of, this is our sitting room, basically. We, we, this is um, this is a wooden doll I made of Madame Tussaud ages ago for for the book, um, for the book, the, my book Little, um, and um, this is a bust of uh, Pinocchio. Um, and there's uh, behind me is 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 my fake Jacques Louis David uh, painting of uh, Madame Tussaud. So. Oh. Yeah. I have to say, um, I've, it's just a pleasure to be talking to you again, because obviously we, we were very lucky to house you in Bath when you came to chat to us about Little, and we've obviously got another fantastic thing to chat about, The Swallowed Man, and I've got a slightly crumpled paperback, and that's a sign of love, I only destroy books that I really adore, <laughs> because they come with me everywhere, uh, so yeah, thank you for making it, it's just gorgeous, it's, uh, it's in our Christmas catalogue, and Emma's loved it and raved about it and sends her best wishes as well. Um, oh. But it feels very topical. And I think that's probably one of the one of the kind of perfect things to talk about first with this book is that you've created a story set in this incredibly isolated world, this kind of belly of the beast. And you're, you're seeing uh, everything through the eyes of, of Geppetto. Uh, how, how did you feel about this coming out now? It came out in September in the UK and it's obviously very poignant for a lot of people. I think it, I think it is horribly poignant. I wish it wasn't. Um, um, it was certainly not my intention. And then suddenly I realized we're all really living inside the belly of a large fish right now. I mean, this is, you know, this is, this is our daily existence. And I think, you know, the challenge is, of course, how do you keep yourself sane and occupied and and how do you be optimistic in 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 such a situation and i think there are ways and i think you know there are many ways actually and i think uh, geppetto who can't get out at all um is in perpetual darkness does find a way of actually trying to 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 battle his situation um in a constructive way um and sometimes he succeeds and sometimes it gets him down, <laughs> but, but yes, I, 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 it, it does feel horribly apt. Um, I just wish, I wish it wasn't. These are such, such strange days. And I, when I sat down to write Geppetto's journal, I just thought, here we are. This is a sort of Robinson Crusoe exercise about art and and how you know it keeps human beings going, um, and then it's turned into something 
something else. Something rather more relevant, yeah. And something that I desperately want to find out about is the creation of this, because as you said, this this was born quite a while ago. I think it came out first in, in Italian. Um, to begin with, I was given uh, an art commission by the Parco di Pinocchio in, Col in Colodi in Tuscany, the little town of Colodi, um, where they have a sort of uh, Pinocchio uh, theme park. And, um, and they, they, they said, would you like to do an exhibition? And they beautiful exhibition. I said, well, yeah, yes, of course, I've always loved uh, Pinocchio. And I went back and read it and read it and read it and read it. And I just thought, oh, my God, Collodi puts Geppetto for two years. He gets him out of the way. He doesn't want him in the story for a while. So he shoves him off in, inside the belly of an enormous shark. Uh, it's not a whale. It's a, it's a shark in the original. And, um, and I just thought, well, what do you do? What's he do for two years? And, and, and Collodi says nothing about it. It gives him, like, two sentences. All we know is that, that there's a ship. Uh, a shipwreck in, inside the inside the fish with 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 um, supplies in it, so he can survive. And I just thought, what would he do? And I thought, oh my God, he would create. He would have to. He's an artist. He made his son. Um, he would have to create to 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 stay alive. And I thought, you know, so much of Pinocchio is about. He's such an amazing character. The wooden puppet is is such an amazing character. But he's full of life. He's not the the wet in a Tyrolean hat that Walt Disney would have you believe. He's furious and he's screaming for life and he's saying, "What is a human? Why can't I be a human?" And I just suddenly thought, "Oh my God, here's Geppetto in the shark, and he's asking the same question." What is a human? And I think, you know, they sort of meet each other um, uh, and it, it becomes his, his um, real journey into who am I? What am I? Um, and I think, I think he becomes less and less human as, as it goes on. And I think that sort of journal, that, that journey in terrible isolation, but with a, with a sense of resolution at the end, with a sense of, with a sense of hope, it suddenly it seemed to me the most extraordinary journey. And what would he make? What could he do? And um, actually, the, the, you know, the fun part I had, I wrote all that book sitting in this chair in the dark. I, 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 I shut all the blinds down. And like a method actor. <laughs> sitting in the dark. And I thought, could, what would he what would he make and I thought oh my god he wouldn't have paint brushes but but he would I, I don't know if you can see that but he would this is this is this is a brush he made out of beard hair because he grows his beard and becomes enormous and I can't this is this is 50 years of beard growth here <laughs> um, um I a, a friend of mine with a very fine beard beard provide me provided me with some hair so I could make the brush but I just thought little things like that. what could he do what could he do and I would think you know he has ship's biscuit Mm. So I thought, oh, man. This, this is this bust is he says is is made of 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 this bust of of um, Pinocchio um, uh, um, is is you know he says he makes it out of ship's biscuits. So to create art, he has less food to eat, but the creation of of art of something meaningful to him is more important than filling his belly. Yeah. Um, and it, yeah. it kind of, it sustains him throughout the book, doesn't it? You watch him going through this process of just desperately needing to make constantly to kind of keep yeah. him, himself going. And I think there's a really interesting kind of marriage in this book between creating an art and kind of mental health and stability. And mm. I think that's probably something that a lot of people have felt this year, especially, you know, I think the, the rise of kind of doing things whilst we've been stuck in lockdown has, has you know, been really a lifeline for so many people. But does that mirror in some ways yourself? Because you're obviously this voracious creator, both in kind of art and in writing. Is it is it something that you have in common with, with Geppetto? Yes, I think so. If I'm not doing something, I go a bit nuts and I'm not much fun <laughs> to be with. So I always, <laughs> have to, I always have to have projects, you know, going. And um, when the pandemic started, I was in London and I flew back to be with my family. They were supposed to be joining me. We were supposed to go out and go up to Edinburgh for for what they call spring break over here, like half term in in um, in the UK. And uh, so we got home and would you know like everybody didn't know how long this was going to go on for and I was writing a um a, a, a book that's set in a children's hospital and I just 
couldn't do it. It was just too dark a subject, too difficult a subject to be dealing with at such times. Uh, and so I said to, I, I sort of casually tweeted, uh, I'm going to do a drawing a day <laughs> until, until this is all over. And I didn't really understand what that would mean. And uh, I now, yesterday I drew Margaret Atwood and she is drawing number 245. And I just, I've got them stacked up and, and, but it's keeping, it's now become sort of my routine and it's, you know, kind of like G Geppetto, I think. <laughs> One of the questions I had in relation to kind of creating the book and creating, because it, it started as an exhibition, as you, as you said, did you did you create the artwork first and then weave the narrative around it? Or, or was it the other way around? Or was it a real kind of chop and change? Did it happen as you go or? I, I, it, it, was a, it was a bit of both. Some of it, some of it I, I, um, I thought, well, what could I do? And then started making the art. But other others of it, I would sit here in this, you know, precise location and and write. And then I would go, oh, what else could he do? And I just think suddenly the horror of it. I thought I got a, I had tons of drift, driftwood that I'd collected um, just just for, as beautiful objects over the years, and I started to to use them. But I suddenly thought one day, oh my God, he would paint the eye of the shark so that he could practice staring at it. Of course, he can't see it. And then one day I was going to this fantastic um, antiques or bizarre objects uh, store here, and there was this huge bone. And I thought, oh God, that would be wonderful for Geppetto. He could paint, he could, he could paint a skyscape on it because he can't see the sky and he could call it his window and he could look out at it all the time. And then, and then one day as, as we were cooking, we were, uh, we were making something with, with um, some squid and I thought, oh, of course he runs out of ink, <laughs> but there are still squid ink and octopus ink and he can make from that. And so I, the, the drawings of, of Geppetto in ink are actually drawn in squid ink. That's amazing. Um, just so I could, you know, feel the, the 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 difference of it. So sometimes I would go, you know, he has to dredge up these ideas of, you know, keeping himself sane. And he also asked that question, you know, who owns who owns the art? Does the shark own it, or do I? Um, so <laughs> it's, it's such a, it's such a lovely thought, and it's such a kind of fascinating thing to wrap your head around is watching this person as they they struggle with all these big questions because they've been given so much time to to contemplate their relationship between art and, and life and it's just it's absolutely magnificent but at the same time it's very unsettling and I I think as well uh, as I mean you're a very gothic writer I think a lot of your your writing and your creation has that sense of unsettling to it uh, but reading reading the book and having all of those those images reproduced within it just gives you that real kind of sense of unease and especially when you get the the um, the ill face, <laughs> the the little kind of dark creature that he creates after one night of drinking far too much wine, that suddenly there's this sense of impending doom and this this real kind of desperate narrative which runs alongside it. Was that? I always wonder with with writers and with writers who create a huge amount of tension in their writing. Do you yourself become unsettled as you as you write it? Do you have that sense of of kind of desperation of, of this countdown clock almost? Yes, I think so. And I was kind of getting, I realised that there is a countdown to darkness, mm, to total yeah, darkness, because he has less and less candles and that's coming down. And I did think, you know, what, I also thought, oh my God, how can I make this more than just a man being slowly digested inside <laughs> the belly of a very large uh, creature? But I felt like I had to. He had to create again. He would desperately try to create. But but if he managed once to create something that came to life, which is what happens in the book in the in the Disney film, the blue haired fairy comes down and, and works her magic. That's not how it happens in the in the book. He just suddenly springs to life. There's no reason. It's just he gives you as much. Kalodi gives you as much explanation as Kafka does about Gregor Samsa's transformation. Um, and so I just thought he would have to, what if he created again the anti-Pinocchio, um, who basically haunts him and is ter terrifying. And I just think, you know, there the, the wood of the ship is, is rotten. And so this very charred root of a, of, of a creature is very disturbing. And of course, when the, I had one, you know, reading the book, you don't know whether 
he's real or not and whether whether he's imagined it because as the book goes on Geppetto tried desperately hard to keep himself afloat but he's been two years in the darkness with just himself and a small crab for company um and that's and you know and that's and that's it and I think I just wanted to push it as as far as I felt it could go but be true to to Collodi and true to Geppetto, but also to to act, to wrench up the the tension, as you say, you know, yeah. to make this a truly gothic experience. And I suppose that's a that's a really interesting question in itself, in terms of rewriting this this kind of nineteenth century work that you know its own phenomenon now. Pinocchio is this huge presence in in so many children's lives, and it is just known across the world and it had its own theme park. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a huge thing when you're when you're recreating a classic a, a story that's been passed down to generations how do you take that line to creating something that, that feels original but also have this kind of sense of truth to the original itself is that a really hard balance it, yes yes uh, yes and no because in, in one point you know Collotti gave me very little, which was perfect um, for 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 him in the in in the shark, um, but also he the Geppetto in the book is not this sweet Swiss Swiss looking gentleman that Walt Disney would have you believe. He's ferocious. He's really bad tempered and kind of foul and cruel to Pinocchio. He's much more exciting. Um, and he has this wig. One of the first things that Pinocchio does is pull the wig from his hair. Um, and um, and Pinocchio gets him locked up overnight in a police station um, uh, at the first night of Pinocchio's life. And then Pinocchio goes. Home, uh, and feeling cold, starts a fire and burns his own feet off. Um, but before he does that, actually, I should I should point out that he's killed J Jiminy Cricket. He's just called the talking cricket, and Pinocchio kills him on chapter two or three. And it's much darker, and it's much stranger, and it's also it's so it's it's beautiful and strange, and it's just asking what's life how can we get life and you know what is a child Pinocchio keeps asking but he is the child he's a perfect child he's a perfect creation even though he is also the patron saint of objects is Pinocchio you know this 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 object that longs to be a living thing and it's so delightful and, and then the book is so amazing I mean I beg people if they haven't read the original to go back and read it because my favorite thing in the whole book and I couldn't put it in because it's right happens right 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 at the end and it's when Pinocchio is turned into a flesh child finally achieving uh, the 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 life that he had he had begged for, Collodi does this most extraordinary thing: is he keeps the puppet behind, like a sort of snake skin, um, and the flesh child looks at the wooden child, and in one of the most extraordinary betrayals in all literature, I think he laughs at it, and that's how the book ends. And it's extraordinary. And, and, and it, it's very, I mean, it, it makes me, it, it's very emotionally uh, charged, but it's a piece of absolute brilliance. And I suppose <laughs> something else that I really wanted to talk about is the narrative voice that you strike with Geppetto. And there's, it, there's some gorgeous phrasing in there. And I, I love the way you write anyway. And I just think there's such a distinctive narrative voice to Geppetto that feels, it feels very honest and it almost feels, Kind of slightly childlike in its it, or the kind of innocence in the way he constructs words and he talks about objects and he and he creates these I don't even know what you call it not portmanteau but you know like wooden life and ill face and you know it, it, there's these it's real kind of honesty in words he's just describing things as they are how do you how do you find a voice for a for a character to make it match up with this personality of someone who's just kind of bearing their all and being brutally honest in their own way well, I think that's always the, the, the biggest trick, writing first person, I think, but, you know, getting to know that personality. You know, it's, it, it's, and as a, as a slightly frustrated actor, it's actually the closest that you could, you know, you could get to is actually to, to, to be him, to have that consistency of, of voices. Just for me, it's one of the greatest delights of, of writing is finding out who that person is. I think it's just wonderful. And I... Uh, we, I know we had a little chat uh, a little bit earlier and I could not turn down the opportunity to hear you do a little reading from the book because you've done one for us 
to listen. And I think now would be a perfect opportunity to, to just hear a little bit of that, that voice of Echo and, and the complete of the story. Oh, yes. I, I, thanks, Audrey. I'll just read the, the first page. How's that? That's perfect. Thank you. I am writing this account in another man's book by candlelight inside the belly of a fish. I have been eaten. I have been eaten, yet I am living still. I have tried to get out. I have made many attempts, but I must conclude that it is not possible. I am trapped within an enormous creature and am slowly being digested. I found a strange place to exist, a cave between life and death. It is an unhappy miracle. I am afraid of the dark. The dark is coming for me. I have candles, they are my small protection, and I have this purloined book that I shall slowly fill. Before the last candle dies, I'll tell my tale. I give you fair warning, I can boast you no battlefields. This is no murderer's story, there is no great romance. But before all this, back on land, I did an extraordinary thing, an impossible thing, and for that thing, in order that the world may be put back in balance, I am now paying a severe cost. I shall tell my shame, my tale of the supernatural, though so devastatingly real. There we are. Oh. <laughs> You, you need to do, I feel like this would lend itself wonderfully to a show, to a, a kind of one man show. It should do, that's the next step, surely. <laughs> oh, oh, that's what I was going to ask. I was going to ask what you, what you read whilst you're writing something like this. Do you, do you read whilst you're creating? Do you draw inspiration from, from other authors whilst you're... Sometimes, um, but I would never touch Dickens when I was writing because his voice is so you know, profound. Yes. You know, you, you would just start doing an imitation of Dickens and I think that would be very dangerous. <laughs> um, I think when I'm really, really working, I try not to read um, uh, too, too, you know, a, a, a book with too much voice because then it will have an influence on me. But there are always those kind of writers that I, that, that I return to to sort of prop me up, like um, Carson the Colours or Bruno Schultz, mm -hmm. um, um, just sort of thinking of you know, kind of on top of my head, Alistair Gray, um, you know, you know, just uh, and, and any number of uh, my brain of course goes blank the moment I try to Helen Oyemi, you know, the, all sorts of writers with you know who just you kind of return to those as sort of your touchstones who keep you keep you going um, that I couldn't be without. So I would have them sort of nearby, but when I'm really furiously writing, I try and keep that voice um, as pure as I can. So without too, too much. I'm, I'm spotting a kind of linking here with narratives of, of fables and, and fairy tales and storylines. Is that, that's your kind of, your, your deep seated passion, I'm guessing your, your love? Yeah, I absolutely adore, I adore, I adore, um, getting lost in fairy tales, and you know, the, is the more I study them, and 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 A.S. Byatt has talked so beautifully about this. The more I feel connected to them, the the more the the strangeness of them, the cruelty of them, and I feel like you know, getting lost in those fairy tales. It's as if you can take off a human head and dive inside the body. I mean, they're, they're about what a human being is. There is there how to survive, and I think. Look at getting lost, those tales, they are extraordinary and they seem to me kind of supreme art. Um, they're, they're, they're fiction, the, the, their life stripped down to its bare bones and they're cruel and they're surprising um, and they're dangerous. Um, and you know, they're not, there's nothing sweet and nice and gentle about them, they're brutal. Um, and I was reading something that Mar Margaret Atwood said and I'm not gonna quote it, correctly but she said and I just thought oh, god this is so brilliant all stories are about wolves mm. and I thought oh my god and if they're not I don't care about yeah. them she said and I just thought oh my god that's so brilliant I do I have one more question that I could not not ask you and I you might have to go and I mean you probably won't have to stretch very far 
I want to know what's the strangest thing you have in your house. <laughs> oh Lord. Um, uh, I, I'm trying to think. What have we got? What have we got here? Hold on a sec. <laughs> here we are, Lottie. Oh. So now I want to do this so you can see this. This is a this is a box. We bought this. Um, I would say my wife, uh, who's a novelist, uh, Elizabeth McCracken, and I love. Um, Odd, odd things and objects and collecting objects. So this is this is actually something that my wife desperately felt she needed, and I'm absolutely agree. And it's a box of teeth, of very large teeth. They're um, enormous. Yeah, they're not real. But they're bake like, <laughs> but, they were, <laughs> but 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 they are. But they are a kind of uh, they're, they're beautiful. They're, they were. I think they were made for you know for for, for dentists to understand. Teeth, or whatever. but they're but they're huge and they're they're marvelous. Um, but yeah, we've got all sorts of nonsense all over here, including you know one of the things we most love to do when we're in London is go mudlarking um, on the Thames foreshore, and um, it's my son's particular passion. And so he's survived this pandemic by endlessly sorting through all the different clay pipes and, and bits of, you know, Roman or Tudor stuff that he's dragged from, uh, from the Thames foreshore. Oh, fantastic. It's something I've never done and I'm desperate to do it because it just sounds wonderful. It's, it's amazing, yeah. yeah, it's amazing. And it feels like the kind of gifts of these objects and you again, you're touching history each mm -hmm. time it happens. And um, in, in, the, in The Swallowed Man, the, um, there's a there's a there's a person that Geppetto makes out of um, sort of uh, porcelain bits and pieces, and these were made by by these were I can put it together from bits of the broken china and things that I picked up, not just uh, on, on the Thames foreshore, but but in Provincetown uh, and on Cape Cod and in Tobermory on the Isle of Mull as well. And that's the same thing, and it's okay. just. Like a beautiful porcelain collage of, of different points in your life. It's, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. It's, it, yeah, those teeth are bizarre. <laughs> <Love them. laughs> We've got glass eyes as well. We've got all sorts. Oh. <laughs> you, you, should, you should do an open house and just have it as a kind of museum, <laughs> a cabinet of curiosities. But, but Some people yeah. don't like some people don't like having her around. They, they they went back when we used to have people, but we love her. The kids love her. You know, the kid she would she was in an exhibition at one point, and the kids were furious that they didn't have her. And when she was back, they kept, they hugged her and sat on her lap. And 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 my wife was very very kind when I made I made her in Ireland for an, uh, for for an exhibition years and years ago. And um, my wife had a haircut so that she could have hair. No, she's got to live with her. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> Very unsettling. <laughs> I should probably let you go, Edward. This has been a pleasure. <laughs> oh, God, it's a joy. It's a joy to see oh, you, Lottie. <laughs> as always, as always. Please, please come back to Bath. Whenever you're nearby, do let us know. Oh, I will. As soon as, as, soon as we can, we're going to get out of here. Thank That's you good. for, for keeping on doing what you're doing, because it's, it's, you know, kept so many of us going. So. <laughs> Thank you, Ronnie. Oh, so <laughs> See you very soon. Bye. Bye. Stay safe. Bye. Please note, no good people were harmed in the making of this film. Though some were technologically challenged, all books are available from www.mrbeesemporium.com. <laughs>